Okay, we're going to start off this morning uh, with video and uh, correct me if my memory is failing me, but we did talk about uh, the Kitty Genovese case on Tuesday. And we talked about this recent case on the mass transit in I think it was Pennsylvania about the woman who was assaulted for 45 minutes and upwards of five or six, eight people just pulled out their cell phone, not to call 911, but to video it. Um, we know some more facts. Um, the guy is an illegal alien. Um, he has been convicted of, of a sexual assault prior. He's from Congo. The Congo which is a country in Africa. And uh, he should have been deported. Didn't happen. And uh, these things are going to continue to occur um, if we don't enforce the laws as they were written and meant to be enforced. So, rather depressing uh, subject to have to ponder, but. Psychology deals with the uh, study of the individual and uh, social psychology studies the individual within a social setting. So it's quite appropriate that we talk about, and of course, the, the book talks about the Kitty Genovese case. New passwords, I've already done it. All you do with your dollar, every dollar is, is literally just drag and drop. You drag one of these cords with your drag and drop. Boom, just like that. Okay. About to watch this uh, Aaron uh, experiment done on the bridge, so that'll be posted on Blackboard. So we're going to take a break here and pause, and then come back when we discuss. All right, we just finished the film, and now we're going to discuss it. We'll start with Tim Mannon here. Do you think this woman acted in any way that if she would have acted that way in front of you, that you would have got any indi any indication that she might be open for getting to know you better? No? I bet the women can figure it out. Any of you? No? You don't work that way either, huh? Well, 
Okay, I'll mention the things that I saw. I had to write down because I forget. Here's something I did. I'll freely admit it. If I'm trying to flirt with somebody, rather than walk over to them and say, wow, that, that blouse is really colorful. I like that. But if I'm flirting with her, I will say, that blouse is really pretty. I just love it on you. What's the difference? Love. Put the word into the conversation. Not I love you, I want to love you, but is this a great day outside? I just love weather like this. You're setting the stage, okay? Those of us who try to manipulate others, okay? Well, this one's boring. Okay, I'm conducting research. You have your uh, clipboard. I have my clipboard. And I say, look, I don't have much time here to talk with you, but I would love to discuss it with you. Here, let me write down my name and number and give it to you. Guys, you missed this clue because what your brain should have told you, if this is something she normally does during her research, she would have had a card or something and said, do you want to know more about this research? Here's a card. No, no. She rips off a piece of paper, which looks like it's totally spontaneous. And you're thinking, unlike you two, I would say, wow, this is unplanned. We got a little magic going on here. And, and how do I feel? I'm jacked up. My heart's racing. My blood pressure's up. Which is all because of the surroundings I'm in. But I'm not consciously thinking that. All I know is I'm standing in front of this attractive woman. And she gives me her name. And, and tells me I'm in a hotel. Not you can come visit me at the graduate psychology building at UTEP. No, you can come visit me in my hotel room. It may not be Las Vegas where what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, but if something does happen and we're in a hotel room, no one's gonna know. So if you're married, if you're involved in a relationship, no one's gonna know, right? What else? I hope you call me. That's me telling you directly to your face. I want to hear from you. Not if you want to know something more about this research, you can learn more about it by looking at my uh, website or uh, shooting me an email or something. No, this is I want you to call me. I hope you can call. Then look at the stories. Just a picture of a woman. Innocuous, you don't really, it's ambiguous, you don't really know what's going on. So when we're jacked up, heart rate, blood pressure, dry mouth, excited, all that unconscious stuff going on. When somebody asks us to look at a pretty much ambiguous picture, those of us who are on the scary bridge are more likely to involve what? Romantic stories or sexual stories? Really? And when you meet on the flat bridge, it's solid and it's not swinging, it's not any kind of threat. What's the difference? You walk on that bridge, it's not elevated very much, it's solid, it's not waving in the wind. Your bio side of your body is not jacked up. Oh, anyway, 
my own writing. Unconscious attributions. Remember, we talked about in this block of study for these three mods, we talked about attribution. What do we attribute somebody else's feelings um, and or what do we attribute our own feelings? So if a guy's doing a self-assessment after he walks away, he might say, man, I have something about that one. Woo! Glad I got a number, okay? And you can attribute, even though you guys are smarter than me, you can attribute to something like this that she is personally interested in me. She might be conducting research. But she's personally interested in me. And you can attribute to her that because she did that, she used the word love, she dropped the fact that she's in a hotel. I attribute to that that she's kind of turned on. So that's a long explanation into the two factor theory, both physical arousal and cognitive appraisal. There are tons of research in social psychology. There are experiments where social psychologists at university, colleagues like this, you are going to get paid to participate in this research. So, they pair up a female and a male, don't know each other. You sit in your chair, I sit in my chair, not this one, but so we're fairly close together, but we're not touching. And then and then you're asked to do some exercises, like put your hands up like this, and they put their hands up like this, and you do it for 30 seconds or something. Now I want you to look into each other's eyes. And hold that gaze for at least a minute, and we'll tell you when the minute's up. All this stuff, right? Then we say, okay, thank you. And then what they do is they follow up with the two individuals. What percentage of these two people, and we're looking for people who are single, what percentage of these two people? end up asking one or the other out and then sort of starting a relationship. And you think, wait, wait, we're just doing this? You know? It's not like, uh, talk about the thing that's the most sexual thing that's ever happened to you or sensual. None of that. Just things like this and looking in somebody's eyes. The statistical significance is off the chart. Off the chart. Amazing. So, little things like this can have a big, big influence on your life. And then when you ask somebody, what drew you to this person? Answer? I don't know. I just, I just had a feeling. Just, Really felt like there was some dynamism, some magnetism between us. When really what you're saying is, man, my whole physiological system was jacked up. And looking back at it, I now realize it was because I was on this swinging bridge that was threatening. Um, interesting. Oh, by the way, the guy, I can't remember his name right now, the author who wrote the book, the social psychology book that I used to use chapter 10 out of in my human sexuality class, he starts off in the beginning of the book talking about an experience he had in college where he was a little bit reserved, kind of a guy. Um, 
and I don't know whether it was a freshman or a sophomore, I think it was certainly an undergraduate school. Somehow or another, he found out that there was going to be this woman on campus uh, giving some instruction on dance. And so he was thinking, maybe I'll go to that, see what that's all about. And so the person is kind of like people we have here. They come in from the outside, they give their little speech, and sometimes they're kind of promoting their program, you know, health and wellness, or in this case, this woman was promoting going to her class, and you could learn, you know, like five different types of dance, ballroom dancing, cha-cha, uh, whatever. And uh, he... I don't remember whether he volunteers or she chooses him out of the group who's standing around listening to her lecture. Anyway, he's up front with her, and she apparently is very attractive, and he uh, volunteers or at least follows her suggestion that she's the one who started it to show that somebody who doesn't know anything about dance can learn some moves very quickly if you just listen and follow my lead, right? So that's what was happening. Of course, he was enjoying it because he found he found her attractive. He was jacked up because he's not a real personable kind of a guy. And now that he's in front of everybody and all eyes are on him, or some eyes are on her, but still they're together dancing. What happens to him? You won't believe it. He popped his belt buckle while he was doing a move. Busted a move and busted his pants, or at least his belt, and he had to take evasive action not to have his pants drop. So it was embarrassing. Embarrassing. So what happened? He, after this whole event, he was thinking about this woman a lot. So, like most psychology, future psychology professors, probably a stalker. And so he finds her and starts up, you remember me from like six months? So anyway, they got married. They got married. And he's the social psychologist instructor who wrote the book. Um, so things can happen. Anybody have any questions about uh, 35 to 36? I have 35 and 36 with me, but we're going to go over 37 today. But I'll entertain questions about 35 and 36. We've got about 35 minutes. Anybody got questions? All right. Well, if you think of something later, you can always shoot me an email or if some of you want a review session, you can schedule that. Do it on Zoom so you don't have to come to a physical location like class. This is the last time I'll see you this week. But if that's something you're interested in, send me an email and maybe we can arrange that later today or tomorrow, even on the weekend for that matter. Okay, so let's turn our attention to mod 37 since we haven't discussed questions on that. Anyone, first of all, anyone have any questions about mod 37 questions? Kind of interesting concepts in this chapter. I'm kind of, 
I find it interesting, like in question number two, which is the mere exposure effect is the answer to that. What is the mere exposure effect? Well, as some terms suggest, just being around something or someone can affect us. Probably not on the conscious level, like the Aaron Bridge study, but it does affect us. There's lots of studies which show the likelihood that you're going to go out or get involved with somebody who is geographically close to you is greater than you getting involved with somebody who is, and I don't know how they define close and further away. But in other words, if you live in a neighborhood and there's two grocery stores in your neighborhood, you might cross this person's path because when it comes to shopping for groceries, most people shop at a place fairly near them. And the fact that you might have seen somebody, or let's say you're a strap hanger, a person who rides public transportation, and you ride the train, the bus at the same time, every day, you go to work, go to school, um, you might get to know people, at least by looking at them, not necessarily talking to them. And that could affect whether you will talk to them, especially if you see them somewhere else. If you, come, if you frequently go downstairs to the food court area and there are people down there consistently because they're on class break, just like you're on class break, and you're sort of impressed with the way they look because you don't know much else about them, and then you see them in an odd place that you would not have expected, like a grocery store or a bookstore, which of course is closed, some place like that, then you're liable to warm up to them simply because you've seen them before. That's also what be described as the mere exposure effect. Number five talks about a woman riding a bus every day at 8.30. Cindy has actually started to feel a little bit of affection for the gruff and scowling old bus driver because many people know some of us who appear old and grouchy were actually a soft marshmallow down below. And if you see us enough times, you might pick up on that. Another good one is like number seven. You have seen Jerry in class every week for the past 10 weeks. Yesterday, we saw him at the food court. You would be likely to see him as what kind of mood? Happy. Why? Because there's a connection there. Not that I want to go out with Jerry, but there's a connection. Oh, I, I remember that guy. Intro. Here's one that'll throw you back. Number eight, people's preference for mirror image photographs of themselves illustrates the impact of the mirror exposure effect. I know that guy. Handsome, isn't he? Yeah. And there's a couple of mirror exposure effects, so you can expect some of those end up on the exam. Um, any of you know anything about speed dating? Participated in it, saw it on YouTube or something? Anybody know what it is? Just this deal where you volunteer to do the speed the, uh, dating thing. A lot of times it's in the uh, location of a, uh, of a restaurant or something. And they have these rules. You uh, sign up and you get to talk to a person of uh, the opposite sex or whatever sex you're interested in, um, but you only got five minutes. And then the bell goes off, like the Chinese fire drill. You gotta get up and move to another table. Sometimes they assign what your tables are, 
start off with table two, then you go to seven, then you go to nine, and then your last one's one or something. Maybe that works. I don't know. But the point is, it's very quick. To, it's not meant to have a long introduction and uh, delving into your personality and your likes and dislikes. It's more kind of a superficial kind of looking at somebody, being physically close to them, but not embracing kind of thing. And then you rank that person on your little card as to whether you would consent to going out with that person if they're interested in you. And then the people who are putting the program on, they look at a factor analysis. Who did you choose? Who chose you? And if you chose somebody and they chose you, then they're going to let you know that that happened. If all the people you chose did not choose you, um, then they just tell you nobody didn't work out with anybody. So you better luck next time. And then they've done a lot of research as to whether that works. And it, it, it is more than just uh, happenstance. It's statistically significant that people in just five minutes can sort of get a vibe about the other person and figure out whether they, they would actually be interested in seeing them again. Now, here's a shocker, complete shocker. Question 14, researchers have found all of the following about speed dating except what? A, compared with men, women tended to wish for a future contact with more of their speed dates. Who would have believed that was true? Nobody. We know how men act. We know how women act. It's just the opposite. Men are more likely to want a contact with a woman, and women are more discriminating. By nature, they're born in great in uh, in their genes in the bio side, biopsychosocial, because women sounds sexist. It's God, it's biology, it's not sexism. Women are the ones who carry babies. And internally, they have to be more choosy about who they might eventually date and get married to, or have sex with, and have kids with, whatever. That's been throughout history. And even though we don't think about it, um, it does play a factor. And is it a surprise to anyone in this room that men, when given a choice of five women, that they're more likely to choose as a number more people they'd like to go out with than a woman? Doesn't surprise me at all. I don't think it should be surprising to you. 15. What determined whether college freshmen who had been randomly paired up for a welcome week dance liked each other? Well, Duh. C, physical attractiveness. Why? Because that's all there is. You don't know anything else. Oh, well, you can walk over and start a conversation. True, true. Who do you choose to walk over and start a conversation with? Somebody that you find physically attractive, not somebody you don't. Sixteen. Fred Lana, a 20-year-old undergraduate, is beautiful. Research suggests that she is likely to be perceived as more socially skilled than a less attractive woman. Why do we think that? Because of our attitude and our prejudice. People who are attractive attract more attention. People who attract more attention get more requests for dates, get Appointed to a committee more often because somebody wants to look at it. You doubt that? Look at 918. Makato, a 21 year old college junior, is physically unattractive. Compared with good looking students, 
Makato is more likely to what? B, have difficulty making a favorable impression on potential employers. Are you telling me that looks have something to do with potential employers? You better believe it. And some of it might be the Aaron Bridge study. Somebody walks in to the interviewing room, they look classy, whether they're male or female, they look classy, they look covered, their hair, their beard, mustache, eyeliner, all this stuff is really looking good. That is gonna send a positive message to the group who might be a committee that's gonna hire you. Now it can backfire. If you're a very attractive woman and you work, you're applying for a job that is mostly co-workers or male, somebody might be hesitant to hire you because they think, oh my God, if I hire this beautiful woman, all the guys in the office are just gonna find excuses to go by her office, and look at her and talk to her. Work productivity is gonna go down. Even though she's qualified, I don't think I want somebody that effective in the office. It's going to be a distraction. So it can work against you. In fact, when you ladies get to the stage where you have a degree and you're going to start interviewing, it would behoove you to volunteer to go to one of these career services workshops where they tell you what you should wear, how, what colors you should wear, whether you should wear lipstick, whether you should not wear a certain color of lipstick, all this stuff, because it could send the wrong message to the people that are hired. Number 20, can't do much about this, folks. In general, symmetrical faces are viewed as more healthy, more attractive. We are drawn to somebody who is symmetrically equal. Twenty-one. Samantha has met several men through speed dating. She is most likely to accept a request for a date from who? Jimbo, who has a good job. He exercises frequently. And he's attractive. There was a, I'll never forget watching this black female comedian. She was talking about putting, flirting with a guy. And so she's up there on stage and she's cringing and she's moving around. And this is what I do. I walk up to him, I've got a big smile, and I say, Do you got a job? <laughs> Beautiful. So, number 23 gets into this issue about do similar people uh, are attracted to each other and end up in a potential long term relationship? Or is it opposites attract? We always hear, oh, opposites attract. Well, the statistics show that that's not true. What might be true is if you're talking to somebody and you're thinking about going out with them, or if you do go out with them and then you're thinking of continuing to go out with them, they might have a skill and ability that you don't have. So you think. If I were to get involved with this person, at least I know they could do this, and I don't like to do that, so that makes him or her compa more compatible to me. Like, for instance, for me, if I found somebody that likes to be really organized and keeps a budget and keeps all the receipts for things together. If I find that out, that is going to be an attractive person to me. If 
uh, already attracted to them, but that's going to be an attractive attribute, personality factor that I don't have because I don't like doing that stuff. So if I could have somebody as a partner that does that stuff, I'd be really happy. Number 24, you've heard this one. Birds of a feather flock together, and that is true. You might have a very diverse group of uh, friends, but generally there's enough things that you agree upon that make you hang together. Let's see. We already talked about 28 and 29. What about 30? What's the answer to 30? If you haven't read it, just read it. What do you think? How about based on the Aaron study? What do you think? No clue? The answer is C. Completed a series of aerobic exercise. What are aerobic exercises? The kinds of activities that make your heart beat faster. You're trying to work up your aerobic side of yourself, therefore your heart's beating faster, blood pressure's up, shooting blood all around the body because you're doing something like jumping rope or getting a fast bag in a gym. It's not lifting weights. Lifting weights is not an aerobic exercise. Running on the treadmill, going on the Stairmaster, those are aerobic exercises. And when you do that, your blood pressure's up, your heart's beating fast, and then you get a phone call, and you're more likely to have the possibility the transfer on this romantic fe feelings for Cassandra because you have the effect of a two factor theory. 32, which statement about passionate love is true? Passionate love reaches its peak fairly quickly. That's the honeymoon period. What comes after passionate love? How about 34? The companionate love. Companionate love is, okay, 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 we had our, our passion time, and we had great sex, and it was all good. Now we're thinking long term, and it turns into a different kind of love. A love that's built on a long term commitment, shared values. Okay. <laughs> Well, 36. The reading tells us what the answer to 36 is. But to me, it's a complicated answer. Other books, like human sexuality, and sex education books will tell you that oxytocin is a hormone 
It's called the love hormone. Well, we all have oxytocin in our system. Mothers, especially nursing mothers, produce a lot of oxytocin. And what does oxytocin do for you? It's a hormone that makes you feel like you want to be close to somebody. You want to hug them, you want to be near them. And it sets the table. If you've got oxytocin rolling around in your system, it sets the table for what might happen between two people. This question says, which of the following hormones does not facilitate passion? Well, depends on how you think about that. If you want to be close to somebody and you want to snuggle with them, I understand why you might not say, well, that's not passion. Passion is you want to jump on them and have sex. Oxytocin, oxytocin promotes trust and longing to be close to somebody. Matter of fact, there are some women, mothers, who have a hard time bonding with their kid for whatever reason. And one of the treatment options is for a physician to give them a little bottle, like a little bottle of Visine or nose spray, have oxytocin in it, and when they're dealing with their child, take that oxytocin bottle, spray it in your nose, because your nasal sinuses uh, are very thin, and things that go off your nose go into your bloodstream pretty quickly. That's why people start drugs, that stuff, because it gets into your blood system and does what you want it to do, get your eye. So 36, the answer is oxytocin, but I would not put that on the test, even though it's an excellent question, because I personally, if you, if you define passion as I want to rip your clothes off and have sex with you, okay, I got it, I got it. Oxytocin is not going to get you there. But if you're feeling you want to be close and you do trust this person and you're hugging them and you're laying next to them, guess what, folks? One thing can lead to another. And then it turns into a passionate moment. So I think that's a poorly worded question, especially when the literature all over the place calls oxytocin the love hormone. So I will not put that question on the test. 27, of course, might be because it talks about trust, and that's true. Now here's a shocking revelation 38. Which of the following is true of non-Western cultures, meaning non-rugged individualistic cultures. What is true? C, lower divorce rates and considerable passionate love as less important in a marriage. We in the Western culture here think it's all about passion. It's all about great sex, great physical intimacy. Other cultures say, no, it's not about that. It's not about that. You take human sexuality and you learn about the Kama Sutra, a book written in India a long, long time ago about sexual positioning and sexual satisfying, and you'll find out that, that having sex, according to the Kama Sutra, it's not about having orgasm. It's about enjoying your partner. 
So when they decide they're going to make love, it might be a five-hour process. And it doesn't even have to involve organ because they're trying to focus on the closeness and the sensation and things like that. Unfortunately, us in the Western world, we're, especially men, we're just more focused on having an ejaculation and feelings and all that stuff. Secondary to uh, taking care of uh, sexual stress. Number 42 is a good test question. All right, there's a discussion on, on page nine about altruism. Altruism is a theory that people do things for other people simply because they feel motivated to do it. They're not doing it to get something. It's not a quid pro quo. People, I'll give you a broad generalization. People your age, Hispanics, my experience on this campus, go out of their way to be kind and helpful. If I got a bunch of crap in my hands, I'm trying to double it around so I can push the button on the elevator. Any of you guys, well, not you guys, because you know me, but if you were a stranger behind me, you would jump up in the front and, and push the button or offer to help me. I can't tell you how many times complete strangers, students, have offered some kind of help. Um, very confidence building and uh, builds your faith in uh, your fellow man. Okay, 48 is on the Kitty Genovese case. That's obviously an excellent question. That's the question. Any of these bystanders uh, answers? Because we've talked a little bit about it. So there's several bystanders. Page 11, there's two bystander effect answers 53, 54. And then there's this kind of bleed over effect, like in 56. Which of the following people would be most likely to help Gita? study for her history exam? Answer, B, Gita's mother. Because she's a mother? No, that's part of it. But she's excited about the unexpected bonus money she just received from her employer. So she's in a good mood. So she might be more likely to help you because she's already in a good mood. There are some social psychology experiments where they take a room full of people like you and they say, okay, we're gonna do this experiment. I've got a stack of invoices and I want you to count the number of invoices that you have. And it's very, very important that you count correctly the number of invoices in this stack of papers I'm going to give you. I'm paying you to participate in this experiment, and this is what I want you to do. Count the number carefully of invoices, and then write that number down. Okay? Everybody got it? Do it. Then I go next door, and I have a stack of $50 bills, $100 bills, $500 bills, and I tell you, don't add these numbers up. I just want to know how many of these bills did I give you? And of course, it's very, very important that you count the correct number 
uh, that I give you. Okay, you already got it. Boom, here's a big stack of money. Okay, we're done. I take the money back, I take the vouchers back, and then the real experiment begins. What happens? I have somebody walking in the hallway. And you are walking behind them, and as you are behind them, all of a sudden they trip and they drop what they have in their hands, so they have to bend over and pick it up. We want we run both groups through the ones that were counting vouchers, invoices, and the ones that were counting big dollar bills. So there's a difference between what those two groups did. Anybody want to venture a guess? Who stopped more often or who didn't stop more often? Based on that information I just gave you. Hey, you that's just a good psychology question. You have what feeling one way or the other? Make it, make it easy for you. There is a difference. Who's more likely to be helpful? The people who are counting money or the people who are counting pieces of paper? Pieces of paper. Because the people who were counting money, even though it's not theirs, even though they're not going to keep it, they just feel puffed up. I just counted $9,000. I have $9,000 on my desk. I'm cool. I'm blessed. I'm gifted. I'm privileged. That is a good word. That's common today. Privileged. I'm privileged. Why? Because you were counting $5 bills? Yes. And they do other things. There's a whole bunch of social psychology research that when people feel like Somehow they're cut above somebody. They act differently. They're both given a big bowl of candy. I want you to count the number of pieces of candy in here. And by the way, one group says, oh, I want you to count the pieces of candy in here. And if you want, you can uh, have a couple pieces, whatever you want to eat, that's okay. Just count the number correctly. And then the other group is, Count them and count them correctly. So how does that affect you? When you go out and somebody drops books or they'll have some other uh, situation which is looking at your altruistic behavior. Those who are able to eat the candy, they're more privileged and they know it. So they're more likely to leave the poor person on the floor picking up the papers. So uh, very fascinating. But social psychology is just, I don't think anybody in here would not agree that it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Okay, I'm going to cut off any questions after 68. I doubt even, I'll even get to 68. I just felt like I gave you too many damn questions on this module. So, all right. I'll try to get 15 questions off each, not 15, whatever, 50 divided by three is 15 on the second round of class. Anyway, 50 questions, <clears throat> um, 16 minutes to complete it. And I'll try to split it among the three mods. So uh, I will make the test available on Friday. As always, you have until Sunday before 11.30 at night to turn it in, complete it. Don't wait for the last minute, of course. And um, if any of you want a study session, so let it be known. I think we're going to do a study question right after today. Class. Um, Good luck. I'll uh, post the uh, new study guides tomorrow, Friday, as well. 
So we'll start on the, on the next one. So we're doing, as you can tell, we're doing less mods, but we're doing it more in depth. So now that we laid the foundation of the field of psychology, now we're talking about things like three mods on social psychology. Right there, I don't even remember what's coming up. Might be personality, I can't remember. But it'll either be two or three mods only because that gives us more time to discuss it. Okay? All right, thank you for attending. Always, if you have any questions, shoot me, text or email. Yeah. You if you guys want to stay here, you can because um, she already told me it's not going to have class in here today. Okay. We don't have to jump up and leave. Which is nice because I hate rushing around. All right.